love you, Jesus. What you did on the cross and you were raised, Lord, for our justification. Today we, we think of what you did. We, we receive the price that you paid. We thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for everything that you did for us. And this morning we are just aware of your presence. You said, I will be with you. I will be with you. You never left us, Lord. You never left us. You are right here in this place. Thank you, Jesus. He is here. The King is here. He is here. Victorious, glorious King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Son of God. I want us to do something in faith here and just shout his name, but at the loudest that you've ever done it before. So if children are sleeping, I'm very sorry. But I I just have to do this, you know. We're going to shout and then the people next door will come and look if we are fine in church. If you can shout at the rugby match, probably you can do it in church as well. Not yet. Yeah, there's a few good supporters. Well, I'm a Stormer supporter. They're from up north. So. I don't know. But let's just shout Jesus. Let's shout His name. I'm going to count to three and you're going to shout. As if you've never shouted in church before, but you're going to go for it. All right? Just Jesus. Because we know it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's victorious. His name is above all names. So everything will bow in the name of Jesus. I'm doing it in terms of the song that we did. In the name of Jesus. Alright. But don't hold back now. I'll take the money down. cloud but they couldn't see him physically but he was still there because time and space and he's outside of it all that means Jesus can be in heaven and here this morning (laughs) Jesus is here and he's in heaven he's right here right now in this place he never left us because if he said I will never leave you I will never forsake you and then he left us then he lied (laughs) he said I will never leave you I will never forsake you did he say that and then he left no he left out of your sight but he's here brothers sisters he's right here right now in this place hallelujah so because we have the image of the spaceship that's why we struggle to understand that he's still here he haven't left us he left out of our sight He was taken out of their sight. But he's in in heaven 
but heaven is not in distance removed from this place. Hallelujah. I, I, I hope I didn't shake you too much too early this morning, on a Sunday morning. But it's true. It's still true. Last night, Clarissa touched on this, and I, and I really feel this morning that this was of God. This was the Spirit of God, because I also, when, during the worship, I had the same thoughts of John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. And I also have another message that I want to preach. So, so I'm, I'm at the same place that she was at last night, sharing on the one thing and then sharing on, 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 on what she had in her heart. But I also want to go uh, to John chapter 14 this morning. Will you just go there? Thank you, Jesus. John chapter 14. All right, so he is here. Jesus is here. He never left you. He never left us. He was taken up into heaven. But what's amazing is in Christ, Ephesians chapter 2 says, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So we are with him and he is with us. Just hear this. God is your house and you are his house. You are in Him, and He is in you. You are one with God. John chapter 17, Jesus prayed, make them one as we are one. And that, that one is not one with one another. That's one with God, and that will lead to unity in the church. But He prayed, make them one, Lord. In John 17, how many of you know the prayers of Jesus are, is always answered? So... Now that means we are now one. <laughs> because Jesus prayed, make them one as we are one. And in John 15, he said, I am the vine, you are the branch. In me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus came to make us one with the Father to bring us into unity, communion, and oneness with God. And he said in John 17, he said, make them one so that the world might know that you have sent me. Make them one. Now, how many of you know this scripture in John 14 verse 12? He says, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, that you will do the things that I did. Those who believe in me will do the things that I did and even greater. Read it in your Bible in John 14 verse 12. It says, those who believe in me will do the things that I did and even greater. Is it there? Anyone? Did you check me up? You're with my dopo. You must watch me. Is it in the Bible? John 14 verse 12, right? All right. But the rest of the verse says, because I go to my Father. And so the whole verse says, he will do the things that I did, and even he who believes in me will do the things that I did, and even greater, because I go to my Father. And this going to the Father will cause you to do greater works. Now think about it. We're not even yet doing the works of Jesus. I mean, we're struggling to even see what he saw. But he said, you'll do greater things than these. When I read that, something in me said, what we have, there must be more. <laughs> and so I was searching for it, looking for it. There must be more. Because Jesus said, we will do the things that he did and even greater. That just challenged me to the core of my being. That I cannot be satisfied with the status quo of religion. I cannot. I have to push on. Go for more. Receive the more. Because he said, I will do the things that he did and even greater. And I'm not even yet there where he was. I mean, I will be happy just doing his works. In my mind. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what is that? Because I go to my father. I just want you to see this. John 17, he prayed, make them one as we are one. And it was all the same topic in the same conversation, speaking of the same thing. And 14, 15, 16, and 17 speak about being one with the Father. Now John 14. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. <laughs> Are you ready? Oh. You believe and rely on God. Believe also on me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you. For I'm going away to prepare a place for you. All right? Now, please, because of years hearing this at funerals, you have the wrong concept. Because this verse is not a funeral verse. This is speaking about a place that Jesus went to the Father to prepare for his people. And he went to that place. And there's a type of that in the old covenant, in the, in the picture of the temple with the holy place and the most holy place and the veil that separated the people from entering into that most holy place. And that is a picture of the presence of God. But Jesus went into the true heavenly tabernacle with his own blood. And he made a place for us. In fact, when he died on the cross, the, the veil was torn. And it's, a, and it's the separation between God and man that was removed. And he made a way for us to be in his presence. And so John 14 says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. Psalm 91 says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty. So he went to prepare a dwelling place for us. And I wanted, I wanted you to see this. He says, and if I go and prepare that place for you, I will come back and take you, now I'm getting confused with the four translations, let me just get to this one, <laughs> and go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Okay, <laughs> so I know it's going to maybe take a while for you to get the picture of Jesus building a mansion in heaven for you, and then when you die, he's taking you to the brick house in heaven. I, it's like, I know it's difficult to, to, to shake that thought, but I will help you this morning <laughs> by the best of the ability that God has given me. That you understand, no matter how heaven looks like, I've never been there, maybe there is an amazing house there, I don't, I don't even know. But what I do know is that this doesn't speak about it. Because John 15, does John 15 speak about heaven? I'm the vine, you are the branch. Is that about heaven? No. It speaks about a place in Christ. John 15. John 17, he said, make us one. All right? So John 15, he, and, it, and, and remember the letter is just broken up in, in um, chapters just for your sake that you don't have to read the whole thing and know where your place is. <laughs> I'm at John 13 <laughs> but it's just one or it's not the letter but the whole book this is a book so it's written and it's and it's it's not just um each chapter is a different event 14 15 16 and 17 is the same talk that Jesus had with his disciples but so John 15 he said father make them one oh, John 15 he said sorry I'm the vine you are the branch all right so in john 14 he said i will come back again we'll take you to where i am so that you um so we'll take you to where i am i'll go to prepare a place for you and when i go back i go i will make ready a place for you i'll come back again take you to myself that where i am you may be also and and to the place where i'm going you know the way <laughs> you know the way. Jesus, um, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the way. Thomas said, I don't know even where you're going. <laughs> you said, we know the way there. I don't even know the destination. He said, I am 
the way. Jesus answered him, I am the way. Uh, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, to the Father, to the presence of the Father, except through me. So Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I'm coming back. When I'm coming back, I'll take you to where I am so that you may be where I am. He said, you know the way there. He, Thomas said, no, Lord, we don't know the way. We don't even know where you're going. He said, I am the way. And yes, your destination. No one comes to the Father except through me. To where? To the Father. To the presence of the Father. And I'll explain why when he came to take them there. All right, so, so let's go on. Um, Jesus said to him, I know, uh, if you had known me, you'd also have known my father. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, then we'll be satisfied. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and still you do not recognize me? <laughs> All right, so let's go on. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? What I'm telling you, I do not say on my own authority. Um, but the works testify. I'm going a little bit fast. Verse 11, believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Do you see it's the same topic than John 17? The Father is in me and I am in him. So when was Jesus in the Father? Right there, before them. He said, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? But then he explained in John 14, I'm preparing a place for you like I have in the presence of my Father. And I'm going to take you to where I am. That where, you, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way there. I'm the way. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Man, I love this. I get excited. So Jesus made a way and he said, Oh, I assure you most solemnly I tell you, if anyone believes in me, he will himself be able to do the things that I do. Now in heaven, there's no need for that scripture. Everything is under control. For us to do the works of Jesus, no need. But on earth, it's needed. And therefore he says, whoever believes in me will do the things that I do and even greater. Why? Because I go to the Father. And then verse, verse 13. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in and through the Son. I will grant you whatever you ask in my name. Let's go to John 16. Are you following? I have, like I said, I believe in heaven. I believe when a person dies in Christ, they will be in heaven. I believe all of that. But these scriptures are talking about something else. You, you get me? So I'm not taking away all of the good. But we pray, Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right? He taught the disciples to pray. So there's something that we need to understand today on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. He did something for us through the cross and in that time till the resurrection. And I want you to see that. He went quickly three days or on the third day. So not three days completely on the third day. He went and prepared a place. And then, okay, let me read verse six, uh, John 16. This is amazing. When I saw that the first time, he imported Alfred. It changed my life completely. Yeah, poch Engels. Like a poch. <laughs> All right. So John chapter 16. Now he says, So Jesus said, in a little while you see me, and again, okay. So some of his disciples questions among, questioned among themselves. Misschien moet ek eerst vers 16 lees. Terug vers 16. 
In a little while, you will no longer see me. And again, after a short while, you will see me. So some of the disciples asked among themselves, what does he mean when he tells us, in a little while, you will no longer see me. And again, after a short while, you will see me. And because I go to my father, what does he mean? What does he mean by a little while? Now, listen, they already asked, what, he, what does he mean by a little while? So now Jesus is going to answer the little while question. All right. And here we are still waiting for a long while. All right. So what does he mean by a little while? Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, are you wondering and inquiring among yourselves what I meant when I said a little while you will no longer see me. And again, after a short while, you will see me. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, you shall weep and grieve. Are we grieving this morning? No. Are we rejoicing? Yes. So then why are we weep, not weeping and grieving if we believe the little, little while is not over? <laughs> My question is, why are you disobedient with your smiles on your face when Jesus said in a little while? No, this is just a way of preaching to bring a point over. <laughs> why are you rejoicing when Jesus said you will weep and grieve until the little while is finished? That's why we rejoice. Amen. Someone is preaching here. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, I uh, said, so Jesus knew that they were. Okay, yeah. We're going to heal them all back. I say, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she gives birth to a child, has grief because her time has come. But when she delivered the child, she no longer remembers her pain because she is glad that a man or a child has been born into the world. So for the present, you are in sorrow. But I will see you again after the short while. Ha ha ha. I will see you again. And then your hearts will rejoice. And no one can take from you your joy. Which declares why everyone was so happy this morning when they came into church. <laughs> because he says here, he says here, I will see you again. And then your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. When will their hearts rejoice? When they saw, like when they, when they see him again, he said their hearts will rejoice. And he explained the short while. And the short while is in connection with the time he went to prepare a place for them. And he also said, I'm coming to take you to where I am that, that you may be also where I am. And so the short while that he said he will not be with them. And he said, I will see you again. And then, when will your hearts rejoice? When you see him again. Now on the third day, hallelujah. On the third day, they came to the grave. The woman came there. And you know, he appeared to them. They went with the message. The disciples struggled to believe. But Jesus appeared to those disciples. Do you think they were sad? They, they probably rejoiced and jumped and shouted and screamed or something. But they were happy. And so the short while is explained perfectly in these scriptures that it speaks about the three days where Jesus wasn't with them. He said, you'll be full of sorrow for not three days, but less than three days on the third day. And so you'll be full of sorrow for that time. But when you see me again, no one will take from you your joy. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. It's going to be a short while. It's not going to be a long trip. <laughs> and when I come back, I'll take you to where I am. You will do the things that I did and even greater because I go to my father. Why? Because now 
<laughs> so on the third day, Jesus stood before his disciples. And he said, receive my spirit. And the church was born. And the Bible declares that he who believes in Christ died with Christ. Were raised with him. And are seated with him in heavenly places. And so Jesus took the church to the place next to the right hand of the Father of authority. He took the church to a place in him. I know Jesus ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father. I know there's a time period there. But he brought them into Christ, into the Father's presence. He brought them into that place of living in the Father's presence. I know it's shaking us, but if you read verse 16, he says, up to this time you've not asked a single thing in my name. Verse 23 says, when that time comes, when you see me again, you will ask nothing of me, because you'll ask the Father and he will grant you whatever you ask in my name. And up to this time you've not asked a single thing in my name. But now ask and keep on asking and you will receive so that your joy may be full. Speaking not of heaven one day. We're not going to ask things in heaven. He says now that the little while is finished, you're going to ask the Father and he will grant you whatever you ask in my name. God has granted you. Now, if you believe it's the three days, if you believe it's with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the point is it was a little while. And my point is not difficult. It is now over. But I can imagine that it was the three days because with great joy, they went to Jerusalem, waited for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's why I believe it's just three days preparation. <laughs> you understand? Because they went with great joy to Jerusalem. And the Bible says you'll be full of sorrow until the little while is finished. Okay. <laughs> is the little while finished? Is the place prepared? Are you in the presence of the Father? So Ephesians says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's why Jesus could say, raise your eyes. See, the harvest is already white. You are in him. He is in you. You, I'll say it like this. The inheritance was already given. If you didn't, you, you were not here uh, Wednesday or Friday or yesterday. I suggest if you can get those messages, if it was recorded, get those. Because I can't go right back into everything. But Christ is the heir of all things. And you are a joint heir with Christ. And Jesus said to those disciples, he said, do you not say it's four months till harvest? He said, I tell you the harvest is already white. Raise your eyes and see. Speaking of his inheritance that's already given. Speaking of the harvest that's already complete. He said, my food is to do the will of my father and to completely finish his work. So he came to finish the work. Christ did it. It is finished. And the harvest is given. All right. So now he already gave the fullness. He gave the, harv the harvest is there. The work is finished. The inheritance is given. You are a joint heir with Christ. When do you get an inheritance? When you die or when someone else dies? <laughs> We're not wishing anyone dead here to get an inheritance because it's far more wonderful to have the people with us. <laughs> True, right? So to have the people is more than the inheritance. And the only way, that, this is the only inheritance, you get the person that actually died for you with your inheritance, raised from the dead. The testator, the one that brought the, 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 the testament is to, we are joined there with Christ. So the father is not dead. <laughs> but someone died and left you a testament. And you are the heir of that testament. You don't die to get a testament. That's why a lot of people are waiting for heaven and i want to tell you if you die in christ you will get in heaven what you always could have had on earth but you'll rejoice 
<laughs> that I just say that? I say there are things that Christ died for you for. For instance, we believe that one day in heaven we'll be healed. There will be no blind eyes, no deaf ears, nothing. Jesus said, you lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. Jesus said by his wounds, or not Jesus, the word says, Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed. Jesus said those that are dead are sleeping and he raised them from the dead. They are, so let your kingdom come. Are you following? Yes. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven there is no sickness. In heaven everyone is happy. In heaven there will be no tears. In heaven there will be no, and you are right. Say thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, we can celebrate that point. That if someone dies in Christ, they are free from the effects of this fallen world. We can celebrate that point. But there's something for you while you are alive and remaining and breathing. <laughs> so just touch yourself. Say, ah, oh, I'm still here. <laughs> and God wants you to receive your inheritance. Not one day in heaven like religion caused you to postpone. But he wants you to lay hold of the things that he paid for with his own blood. And it's including healing and prosperity and peace and joy and life and Christ-likeness. I said, Christ, you are the joined there with Christ. You are the heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. What belongs to the Father belongs to the heirs. You have received your inheritance. Say, so I, I have received my inheritance. My inheritance. The, New the New Testament declares, declares my, inheritance my inheritance that came when Jesus died and he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. So do you see now that I say in John 14 that we are one with the Father, John 17, we died with Christ, we were raised with Christ, we are seated with Christ, that we are in that place and presence of the Father. And this is what I want to say. In the unseen realm, you can say in heaven, because we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So in heaven, in heaven. It's heaven, but it's an unseen realm. In heaven, there is a full inheritance with a white harvest that's already ready to just be received. So say for instance, let's use healing as an example. Someone's ear is deaf. In heaven, there's hearing for that ear. And in heaven, there's an inheritance. And this is inheritance. God is not keeping it away from you, but He's keeping it for you. When the Bible says it's, it's kept in heaven, He's not keeping it away for one day. He's just keeping it safe for the day you come to receive. For the day you come to receive. So in heaven... In the spirit, Ephesians says it like this, Ephesians 1, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are blessed already. It is done. It is finished. The harvest is white. There is perfection there. Christ-likeness, righteousness, holiness, Health, life in abundance, freedom from death, freedom from fear, freedom from sickness, <laughs> freedom from the effects of the fall of man is already there yes. in heaven. And because we have been indoctrinated, we have left it all for one day. And Jesus is saying, my story is open for you to look around in my spirit and lay hold of the things I died for you for. <laughs> there's health for your body. There's peace for your mind. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. There's a leg for you. There's an eye for you. 
There's an ear for you. There's something in heaven for you, <laughs> which is already there. It's already there. So I know it's very radical, but if you can hear me out, I haven't received the fullness. I would look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, and I will be perfect in every way if I have received it. I haven't laid hold of everything yet, but I do forget what lies behind. And I'm stretching forward to what lies ahead. To lay hold for that for which Christ has laid hold of me for. You, you, you know I quoted Paul there in Philippians, right? So, so I, I lay hold of my inheritance. There is, a, there is a perfect white harvest. Jesus said, you say it's four months till the harvest. He says, raise your eyes. The harvest is already white. It's on the field. No, he said further, he said, no, the reaper is already getting his wages, which means it's in the barn. <laughs> That's just to make sure we don't think something else must still happen. That we're able to go into the barn and receive the harvest. God wants you to receive what he paid for with his own blood. And he do not want you to have a postponing mentality. Religion has given us a carrot on a stick and we are the donkeys. <laughs> and everything is for one day postponed. And so we're following the carrot on the stick. A gospel gives you the carrot <laughs> and another carrot and another carrot. Eat, eat, eat. It's yours. Jesus, imagine how we were deceived thinking the little while is still busy happening and that Jesus is still preparing the house in heaven. Man, it's building long. It's like the work is finished. Your house or dwelling place in the Father is complete. You enter by the way, his name is Jesus. And you've entered into the presence of the Father today while you are on this earth and when should a person like it's not his plan but should you die you will live with him forever that's it so basically you just you just you just where you are you are just where you are like you've already passed from death to life you're already out of the kingdom of darkness into light unless you're not born again so will you receive christ today and take a step out of death into life, out of darkness into light, out of the world into Jesus, salvation and redemption from Christ. Jesus is the only way for any man to be saved. He's not a way, he's the way. He's not a way, he's the way. He's the way. Jesus is the way to the Father. The destination is one destination and the way is one way. <laughs> there's no other way to the Father and there's no other real destination that's of any worth. The rest end in destruction and death and deception. That's it. That's the gospel. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It's, a, it's like Reinhard Bonnke says, it's an ultimatum. It's, it's that or death. It's life or death darkness or light come on it's a serious thing but now that you've entered the place of life and into christ seated with christ you're invited to lay hold of the inheritance come on so i set people free today if you're in a hurry you can go i didn't come all the way from podge to rush this sermon I have vital life-giving news for the church. And, and please, and I will not look at you. I won't look at you like that. You just be free. Drink a coffee by the ice and eat a kalkoon for a brand. You know. I really, really, I, like for me, for me, I have an urgency in my spirit this morning where I don't really care if I preach till the next service start in the next town, right? <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll, I'll not be that long. We'll just go for it. All right. So the inheritance is given. We can receive out of the unseen. That's why Colossians 3 says, set your mind 
and keep them set on what is above. Now, what is above? Jesus and his inheritance. <laughs> Colossians 3, set your mind, keep it set on what is above. Jesus said, raise your eyes, see the field is white. Set your mind, keep it set on what is above. Raise your eyes and see that the field is already white for harvest. Set your eyes on the finished work of the cross. Set your eyes on your inheritance in Christ. Think on it. Set your mind on it. Never take it away from there. Don't see the plants half dead, struggling to grow. See the harvest. See the work finished. He finished his work. The will of the Father was that Jesus come to finish the work. And he did it. And he did it. Man, I get excited. <laughs> All right. So now let's go to Acts chapter 20. How will we receive this inheritance? <laughs> Man, I get so excited now. Acts chapter 20. So Paul, Paul was leaving them. <laughs> and he just gave them a last word. And he said, or these people that he spoke to, he said in verse 32, And now, brethren, I commit you to God. I deposit you in his church. And I commend you to the word of his grace. Here's what it's able to do. It is able... To build you up and to give you your rightful inheritance. <laughs> Paul says, people of God, I commend you to him. Because I'm not with you now. But I also commend you to the word of his grace. And that word of grace is able to build you, to change you, to transform you. Like I said, you've inherited God's nature, everything he has, everything he is. The word of grace can build you up and make you like Christ, transform you. But the word of grace can give you your inheritance. If I understand it correctly, the word of grace gives you your rightful inheritance. <laughs> so, instead of us trying... To receive this inheritance or trying to, to imagine the inheritance, the word of grace comes and gives it to us. How does that work? Clarissa said it last night. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And the word comes and paints a picture. A picture in your mind. The word comes and shows you. Your inheritance. You see it by faith. And believe it. Faith comes by hearing. Your heart gets convinced that the fact that you are healed by stripes is more real than the pain in your body. The fact that Jesus paid for your sins is more real than your own condemnation. The fact that Jesus died and gave you an inheritance is more real than your current financial situation. The harvest is white, ready to receive. And the word of grace comes and shows you by the testament what your inheritance is. And the Holy Spirit comes, wakes you up, opens your eyes to see the field white. <laughs> the Holy Spirit comes and shows you, oh, you are healed, you are blessed, you are prosperous, you are full of peace, you have my joy. You're not depressed. Say, I am not depressed. I have the joy of the Lord. I am not sick. I am well. By the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. So, you, like I said, you can't lose. I don't want to preach this defeat gospel. 
but just to help people. You can't lose. Should you die, he already won. So you get it in heaven. <laughs> I said, you can't lose. But he says, why wait? I paid with my blood for you to live, to be well, to receive. And like I said, there's no condemnation. You may walk in a crutch with a crutch. Others walk spiritually or in a soul with a crutch. Bondage. And so each of us have different crutches. You have a physical crutch. Some have emotional crutches. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He loves you. But He loves you enough to show you life is your inheritance. And death is defeated. Life came. So you receive the inheritance. I hope you can still follow. You receive your inheritance by hearing the word of His grace. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And so the more you hear what Christ did and what your inheritance is, your mind receives a picture that becomes clearer and clearer and more vivid and your heart gets persuaded that it's yours. <laughs> and so in the heavenly realm, you start looking around and your mind is set on what is above. And you start seeing the healing that was paid for the power of God, the Spirit of God without measure. You start seeing it and you get very excited because it's yours. And you start by faith receiving. <laughs> So faith is like the channel from the unseen realm to the sea. From the heaven to earth. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Meaning it's not happening automatically. Someone needs to pray it and believe it. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If it happened automatically, why did he teach them to pray? Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the word of grace gives you your rightful inheritance. <laughs> so in your mind, what do you see? Not with your physical eyes, because Jesus didn't say, look at the field. I, I already explained to you, if they looked with their physical eyes, they would see, oh, we're right. The harvest is only four months away. Jesus said, raise your eyes. What eyes? Because they didn't raise their physical eyes because then they would look at the air, the sky. Raise your eyes. <laughs> Jesus said, raise your eyes. What do you This is not blow luck in klein millies. Small, small maize or small millies. Like, Jesus said, raise your eyes. What eyes? It's your spiritual eyes. It's the faith that you have. That's what Ephesians talks about. May the eyes of your heart be... Oh, we're going to finish with that one. We're going to finish with that one. So, you see something. And your heart gets convinced. You see yourself healing the sick. Then you go into the street and you do it. When I pray for people, and I have not got a 100% record, which God already paid a 100% price. <laughs> so I should have a 100% record. But now, because if I can just raise my eyes. But now that my eyes are partially raised, <laughs> I pray for deaf people. And what do I do? I put my hand on deaf ears. This, have happened quite, this happened quite a few times in my life. Maybe I would say thousands of times. I'm not exaggerating. Thousands of times, at least a thousand times, I laid my hands on deaf ears. And at least a thousand times they started hearing. And what did I do? I saw the ear pop open. In my thoughts while I prayed so I had a picture of health and by his stripes we are healed or I had a picture of the power of God healing the sick 
So my inheritance is healing the sick. The sick's inher the inheritance of the sick, sorry, verkeerde Engels. The inheritance of the sick is they are well. So now I pray, I lay hands, and I know sick people get healed when I lay hands. So I get a picture of the ear opening. And the people shout, I can hear. I can hear. That very principle is how we receive anything pertaining to our inheritance in Christ. <laughs> and now in the, ear, in, the, in the area of deaf ears, I receive it easily. But now other stuff, oh, I still struggle because I look with my natural eyes. I look with my natural eyes. I see that the... I remember praying for this one lady and God is faithful because now the picture in my mind of healing is stronger. But I asked this one lady, can you see anything? No, nothing. Now that sentence, no, nothing, caused you to... <laughs> Listen, as if God heals in measure and if it's a worry for Him. So this is what I prayed. I said, why would we worry... This is my prayer. Why would we worry if God can open the eyes of the blind? In that moment, God opened that lady's eye. But now, think about it. You, you challenged with something. You see the crop is almost dying. It's not growing. The reality is staring you in the face. The, the Bible says, we walk by faith. And not by sight. Now let me change it for you in line with what I said. We walk by spiritual sight. <laughs> we walk by faith. And faith is seeing what your physical eyes is not seeing. Hebrews 11, let's look at it quickly. And then Ephesians 1. And like I said, we are in a sprint to the finish line. <laughs> we are sprinting towards the finish line. Here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even making promises of the plane landing or anything. It lands when it lands. <laughs> the, I mean, the, if someone told me this good news, I would say, don't stop. Hey, booty, preek. Don't stop. I would beg my, myself to not stop. Because the more I hear this guy, the more I'm going to receive my inheritance. I mean, I mean, this can just be beneficial. Not wait for death. And he said it. We're not waiting for death. This side of the grave. Which is the side of God's grave. <laughs> no, don't worry. That also the inner later cover. Um, this is one grave. He conquered. I already passed from death to life. And I don't plan on dying. I don't, don't also live to die. Live to live. If you are 90 years old today, live to live. Receive the life of God. And be a testimony of God's life. And if you die, you're also a testimony for living the life of faith until you died in Christ. So you get it? But let's not fear death. He conquered death. If we die, we live. But we're not planning to die. We're planning to live. The easy, easy way of living. <laughs> death is of the past. It's in the past. I'm not, I have no death in the future. It's done. I died with Christ. Hebrews 11. Verse 1. Now faith is the assurance. The title deed of things we hope for. Being the proof of things we do not see. Right? And the conviction of their reality. Listen to the Amplified Bible here. Faith perceives or perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Faith perceives... As a real fact, what is not revealed to the senses. So we walk by faith and not by sight. Raise your eyes and see that the harvest is already white. See that the, the, 
the reaper already got his wages, meaning the harvest is in the barn. <laughs> we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith perceives as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. And so I'll just pray for you, I'll pray for you and read Ephesians 1 and do it as a prayer. Okay, now I'm putting my faith with Paul in praying this prayer over you. Okay, so pastor, what can I do to receive my inheritance? Faith comes by hearing. So what do you need to hear? The word of the New Testament, not the letter, because the letter kills. God made us able ministers of a New Testament. Make sure you're in a New Testament church that preach Christ, and this is one. This is such a church. There's others also. But be in a place where you hear the work of Christ that's finished, the good news, the gospel. Not a message of motivation, of you becoming stronger. You must make it. You will make it. It's, it's very popular. And the crowds are big where motivation is preached. But I'm telling you, your willpower will fail you sooner or later. And hopefully sooner than later because the suffering is unbearable. Now, I'm telling you, setting up for failure. It's like the branch getting motivated to produce fruit outside of the vine. You get it? So faith comes by hearing the gospel, not by hearing motivation. <laughs> motivation works with your willpower. The gospel produces faith. Faith. And faith receives your inheritance. That's why he says, I commend you to the word of his grace, not the word of motivation, law, legalism. <laughs> you get it? <laughs> the word of his grace produce or gives you the inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm closing. <laughs> Someone say, thank God. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I know you're saying, oh, no, Lord. No, don't let him stop now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. Verse, verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And this is what he prayed. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, this is my prayer for you, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. Okay, so I'm at a new in, in, in NIV. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ that He may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the deep, intimate knowledge of Him. By having the eyes of your heart, your imagination, your thoughts, you always imagine the worst because you are physically sense-driven. But if you have faith, you expect God's glory around every corner. Jesus said to, to, to Martha, did I not tell you if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Hallelujah. So, and so now, um, let me just finish it up here. It says, by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light, so that you can know and understand the hope. Biblical hope is future. So the word also produces a picture of where you're heading also. But that is received. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So, I hope, so you need faith to lay hold of the inheritance. Otherwise, it remains futuristic. Faith is now Hope is future. Both are good, but faith receives what is hoped for. Okay, so it says, may you have the, know the hope to which he called you, and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints. <laughs> so may the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know him, knowledge of him, know the hope to which he called you, and also know his glorious inheritance. So Paul is praying for them just for their eyes to open for their inheritance. Isn't that awesome? Come on. And so that you may know what um, the immeasurable, unlimited, surpassing greatness of his 
power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in his working, the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above, and you are seated there also, far above rule, all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet. So, well, let's just say, we pray that the eyes, yes, let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That you may see him, know him more. The hope to which he has called you, the glorious inheritance that you already received in Christ, and also have your eyes open for the power, power that is in you. And it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Amen. Amen. See, I'm not a lying preacher. I said I'm finishing and I'm just finished. I want you, we're going to pray for one another. You, you're going to lay your hands on a person and ask him, what can I pray for you for? Now, let me just say this outright. Unless it's, Father, kill that person, my enemy, which is not a biblical prayer. <laughs> because they wanted to call fire from heaven and he rebuked them. And if it's anything natural... Say the guy needs a new car. Don't think, oh, this guy just wants cars. Pray for his car, man. This one needs a godly husband. If they say, I want a husband, add with it godly husband. Like if it's such natural things, someone say, I need revival. Pray for the spiritual things also. But whatever comes first, maybe one or two things, mention it to someone next to you. And let them pray for you now. Because in the light of our inheritance, Jesus said, ask whatever you will. That's why he said it. So, we're going to receive things. And the one next to you is going to pray for you. So, I want you to turn to one another. If you, maybe turn to someone you don't know. Go to someone, well, no, maybe you don't know them that well. Otherwise, everyone will turn to poch people. <laughs> you have met them, but you don't know them personally. It's like, very good. So turn to some other people that you haven't spent years and years with. <laughs> and pray for them. And the one pray for the other, and then you turn around, and the other one pray for you, and lay hands on you. But this is how you pray. Not if it's your will. Father, maybe it's your will. The thing that the person's going to say even if it shocks you, it's part of their inheritance. I'm telling you, Jesus already paid for the thing. <laughs> already paid for that thing that you think, oh, that's not a spiritual prayer. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> religious. <laughs> be spiritual, but not religious. Pray for whatever the guy asks you to pray for, as if God already paid for it with his blood. <laughs> Your inheritance is all things. Hebrews chapter 1. So, so let's pray for whatever... That's John 11. Ask whatever. Let's pray for whatever. The guy that you pray for is you, whoever. And the Bible says he can have whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's Hebrews. Oh, John 11. No, Mark 11. John 11, Lazarus. Mark 11. Are you ready? Start praying. <laughs>